Welcome to Rattle Cards TV on RattleCards.com. I'm your host Patrick Greeno, and today I'm hosting Brian Hayes of LinguaSportsCards.com, and we're doing a, a, a segment of questions. If you're unfamiliar with the segment, it's three questions. We talk about them for five minutes each, with a standard deviation of about three to five minutes for miscellaneous dialogue. So let's get to it. Question number one: With regard to product options, when does choice become a problem? Um, when does choice become a problem? Let me think. I I think it once again these, these are these are great questions. They're hard to answer because so many collectors have different collecting goals. Yeah. I think for for player collectors, generally speaking, the more choice you want to see a lot of products out there because you know the goal is to get as many to get as many cards of your 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 guys as you can, and the more different sets and products out there. That gives you more more options to chase. Um, for for other collectors, you know, especially people looking to maybe build build sets and stuff, um, it gets to be it gets to be a problem when the market as a whole doesn't have time to absorb a new product. One product comes out, you know, and then the next week another one comes out. When when that happens, when there's this this overlapping of products coming out. The market can't absorb them. Products come and go, and there's just there, there's just no 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 time for anyone to really get a sense of a product, what's in it, what's not in it, what what are its strengths and weaknesses. It's just on to the next thing. And so I would say, generally speaking, you know, when when it gets to the point where one product is still sort of in its release mode, and then just another product is sort of jumping jumping on top of it. That gets to be too much, and that's that's something that you know I personally don't like. You know, choice at, at at some point, choice can be demotivating, right? Because if we see if we go and we see say a menu at a restaurant, you know, I, I used to go to In and Out Burger, and they have like three items. It's really easy. You go in there, you're like number two with animal style or whatever. They're like hidden menu. It's easy because I can see, in, even in my peripheral, everything that exists. I can look at the menu and see everything they offer. Whereas when I go to like Cheesecake Factory, it's like they give you a, a, a you know, a, a 200 page book and they're like, we'll, we'll, we'll come back in 45 minutes once you reviewed <laughs> and like the first seven pages, you know? And yeah. so um, at that point, I'm like, well, it's, it's too many options for me to spend. I don't want to spend that much time thinking about it. I really just want to get straight to the point, right? So, um, uh, this is kind of something else I talk about in, in business is that is that choice a certain number of choices can be motivating because you see options like you know option A through you know E or F you know four five six whatever now if you have that, that that's manageable I can think I can see I can conceptualize four five and six the numbers four five and six I can see I can conceptualize five and four five and six dollars. I can't conceptualize a million dollars. I don't know what a million dollars looks like. So if I have a million options, which is a gross overstatement, obviously, in cards per year, um, but 30, 40, 50, 60, I can't conceptualize what 50 and 60 looks like. And that's a lot, right? And it comes to yeah. point like, where do I put my money, my focus, my collecting habit? Where, where, does it, where do I apply that knowledge, right? What do I do with that? And so when I think about choice, I think that there is a plateau, there is an ideal number um, of options that, that can be met. Um, choice in the 80s was easy. We had a couple of brands, we had cards, we had you know, very few inserts, if any at all. Those sort of like started to come out in the late 80s, early 90s. And it was easy to collect. I can complete a set. You know? As years went on, more and more companies produced more releases, more insert sets, more parallels. I mean, it becomes almost to a point where, you know, at least the way I collect, there's a, there's a certain year where there's a drop off for me. I just don't collect beyond that, that year because it's just, it's too much. I have too many options. I don't know which Albert Pujols rookie to buy in, in my price range. Um, you know, there's so many different versions of the cards. You know, which one do I want? Do I want a blue refractor? Do I want an orange refractor? Do I want to hold out for a red or, or, or you know, a super refractor? Um, does it matter? Do I want to stick with a base auto or a refractor auto? I mean, where, 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 does, where does it become too many options for me to be like, you know what, hands up, I'm, I'm just going to stick with what I know, 
and I'm going to walk from there, and I'm good. So it's, it's always interesting to see when I see too much of something, it, it's almost like I don't want to, I don't want to buy any of them. It's almost like scare, humans are attracted to scarcity, right? Scarcity? So, yep. you know, if we see one of something, we know it's rare, so we want it. But if we see a million of them, we're like, well, I guess I don't really want this anymore because there's so many of them out there, right? So if I right. see if I see a brick of a uh, perfect example is, is a buddy of mine has a brick of Jack Morris seventy eight tops rookie cards a brick of like two hundred three hundred straight solid brick of them and I have two or three myself and I'm like I look at my two or three and I'm like well these three hundred of these these aren't really that big of a deal you know so it actually options too many options may present the possibility, not the guarantee, that we may in fact find the products less desirable because there's so many of them. Thoughts? Yeah. yeah, no, I just I think all these all these things are legit. I think I think all this is is all the more reason why collectors now tend to specialize much more than they used to. It used to be um, you know, let's, let's say, let's say the eighties and before, you know, crackers, you know, they could go after all the, all the major sets out there because there just weren't that many, like you're saying. Now, if you, if collectors don't have some sort of focus, some sort of drive to their, to, to their collection, you just get overwhelmed no matter what you do. Like it's just, it's just impossible. There's, there's too many sets, even though, even with all the, the sole licensees for the major sports now, one company, there's just still, there's just so many products that without, without some jurisdiction to the cards that you're going to buy, you're, you're just going to drown in, in all the sets. And that, that's a big change um, to, you know, how things used to be. I'd be very curious. You know, we started collecting, I think, in the, you know, near the, the same time frame. Um, for collectors who are new to the hobby, let's say who, who came in, like, post-2000, you know, or mid-90s mid later, what their feelings w w would be. Collectors, I mean, a lot of, a lot of collectors left, but for, for, new, for relatively new collectors what their feelings would be because they, they might not have so much um, those experiences in like the eighties and before to, to make the comparison to fewer sets, which allowed for more general collections as opposed to now where collections tend to be more specific. Good stuff, man. I'm glad we covered that. Interesting, interesting stuff. So <clears throat> question two, if a company is dealing with product category stagnation and in some cases extinction, i.e. print media such as catalogs and price guides, what can the firm do to reinstate their candidacy as a relevant category leader? I, I think that the first thing that they've got to do is understand that maybe it might not be in their best interest to, to maintain whatever category they were leading in. Times change, and sometimes... The first question I think they have to ask is, okay, we're losing, we might be losing ground in a certain area. Does it make sense for us to try to reinvigorate this area or just say times have changed and, and move on? So I guess to answer the question, I don't know if companies, I think their first question should be understanding, does it make sense for them to, to try to reinvigorate some sort of category where they're losing? Print media, for example, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's becoming less and less important. And I don't think, you know, whatever a company, if, if a company is trying to maintain that edge going forward, I think ultimately it's a losing game. They've got to diversify. Um, so I think it's, it's an understanding of, there's two questions. Is, does it make sense to, to stick with that area? And if so, does it still make sense to try to diversify uh, the company's product and focus a little bit at the same time. So this is an interesting question, right? So I'm always reminded of companies like Blockbuster and, um, well, Netflix years ago. Uh, so if your category is dying, you have to reinvent your brand to make it make sense to the, the current market, right? So if you're a CD shop, and CDs are going, you know, they're essentially it's a dead market now. Um, Reposition your business so that you're selling what's being sold and what's pro what's present in, in the audience in, in the market now, what's desirable in the market now, and you know, 
move dead stock and, and reinvent that category in a way. Um, with, with Blockbuster, if we were talking about specific firms and, and, and things that are dying, something they could have done was create their own video streaming internet online you know, platform and done away with the physical inventory. Now people, when they can rent movies from Blockbuster online, let's say, um, much like how we have Netflix, right? Um, you know, video games uh, is another thing. Uh, where it's be the platform is becoming more downloaded straight from the console or downloaded straight from your, your TV. And so the tangible video games themselves, the discs, the cartridges, are becoming antiquated. So a company like GameStop might be at risk of becoming an antiquated in the next three to five years. Uh, with price guides, because we have so much at our fingertips, uh, with uh, eBay completed listings, um, you know, uh, going online and seeing what's been sold for what almost in real time. You know, we can see that. We're not, I, I, I'd have to like survey the audience and see if there's still a large stretched market for print anything anymore in terms of the hobby. Um, I know that PSA does the SMR, but I also know that that's not their primary cash cow. You know, that's in, ad in addition to their memberships, they send that this out. This is not their core. This is uh, a, per a, ter a tertiary uh, um, a, um, service that they offer. Their core is their grading services, right? They, they captured that market in a large way. So with businesses that are in a risky market, what they can do to reinvent themselves to stay relevant um, is to provide something in a way that positions themselves to offer a similar service, but done in a way that the market is, is adopting it currently. So like we talked about with Blockbuster, do away with physical inventory and go online streaming. They were already so far behind when that happened that you know they had lost market share to some significant degree to where they couldn't catch up. And it, all, all the thing they could do was file bankruptcy, right? right? So with current businesses, do businesses try to maintain the integrity of the model that's failing and hope that they can continue that forward? Or do they scrap it all together and, and, and cut their losses and focus on reinventing that, that category in some way, their own version of that category, what they offer their service, right? Yeah, that's um, um, talking specifically about cards and price guides. You know, price guides, regardless of whether they're hard copies or electronic copies, um, you know, like go on to Becca.com, they have an online price guide. Sure. Either whether hard or, you know, electronic online, it's still, the consumer can still get the information faster, like you were saying, in real time, go to eBay or other sites, and there, there's a history right there. And so that's going online in, as far as price sites go, it's going to be a little bit different than maybe some other industries where products have moved from the, the tangible, the physical, to online. Price guides, that's not going to be enough because collectors can just find that information outside of price price guides, whether you know they're physical or online. That said, um, the last I checked with, with Beckin, it, it's been a little while now. I believe that they started adding a service to their price guide where they, they show you like recent eBay sales at least or something on there. They've added some features. They're trying to trying to go that direction. Sure. I'm not sure where that is right at the moment, but I think there is an appreciation with Beckett at least that it needs to go in that direction. Sure, sure, sure. I think that that's certainly a, a good move forward for them. And if you want to talk specifically about Beckett, um, you know, focusing on the services, the other services they provide, like um, they have the My Organize, you know, where they have the, the full checklist. That's a huge handy feature, I think. Um, mm -hmm. So instead of just focusing on a price guide, you've got these other services and you can diversify um, and, and, and make money in these other ways so that in the, in the event that the price guide becomes less desirable and not so much cash cow anymore, um, you can still maintain profitability by having diversification in your market, your, in, in, in your, your products and services. So I, I think certainly Beckett has that going for them if you want to talk specifically about Beckett. But yeah, it is nice to see that they do have the services of, of market average sales. I, I certainly think that's a, 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 a critical move forward for them. Um, yeah. it's, it's, it is nice to see that. Um, good stuff, man. 
Question three. In the current market conditions of ultra-long lead times to procurement and replacement, do modern redemption cards help or hurt the state of the hobby? Um, do they help or hurt? I believe ultimately they help. Um, I think that the companies, as much as everyone complains about redemptions and the time, at the end of the day, people really want awesome cards. And I think people have shown that more often than, more often than not, they're, they're willing to wait to, 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 to get an awesome card if it, if it means waiting months and stuff. You know, people consistently have shown that they're, they're willing to do that. Redemption cards are all over the place. And so that tells me that, um, you know, that's, if that, if that exists, then that is something that the hobby may need to, to stay afloat. If the alternative is no redemptions or fewer redemptions, but at the end of the day, consumers are ending up with cards that they aren't particularly fond of, I believe it's a net loss for the hobby that way. I believe you're going to have fewer collectors if there's just not that, that thrill, thrill factor there with redemptions. Obviously, in an ideal world, there'd be fewer redemptions or the ones that are there, they get redeemed faster. But I think, you know, redemptions have been around a long time now and it just feels like the redemptions, the, the number of redemptions, it, it's certainly not dropping. So that, that, that tells me that con consumers are willing to, to put up with them. And if they're willing to put up with them, that, that tells me that they're here to stay and that they're, you know, they're, they're part of the hobby now going forward. Yeah, this is, this is an interesting one for me. And, and the only reason is because redemptions in a large way, in my own, the way I collect, is, is, a, is a large reason why I don't buy modern products as unopened wax. Yeah. Um, I don't have any romance toward opening it. Just, I'd rather somebody else do it. I'd just rather somebody else enjoy that process. So if I get a wax box, I'd rather just sell it to somebody else that can enjoy the process of opening it. And if they pull something I want, I'll just buy that back from them. Uh, but that's a, that's a moot point. Um, redemptions, interestingly enough, you know, if I pull a piece of cardboard that says you're due to receive, you know, X, Y, and Z number to five, refractor, auto, jersey, whatever, um, and I send it in and I don't hear back for, say, you know, I've heard horror stories of four years long wait times and then they don't even get the card they sent in for. So it's like, is that doing a service or a disservice to the, to the, to the, the consumer? With redemption cards, you know, I've heard these, these just tremendously undesirable situations where consumers have had to wait years to get their, to procure their, their redemption card. And then sometimes when they get them, they're not actually, in fact, the same card that's listed on the redemption card, you know, um, cardboard piece. Uh, and so is, is, does that, is that a good service or a negative service to, to a consumer? Because I feel like consumers, the definition of consuming is having it, right? So right. if I'm getting something where I have to wait now, you know, it almost compromise the compromise the integrity integrity of the very definition of consumption and so if if, if i want to have a card to send in and wait it's it, it better be a darn good card for one because i'm not having to wait for it and usually they are um and i right. will say that and i understand the redemption process i it, to my understanding it works like this we can move the product out faster if we put the redemptions in with the expectation we'll have the cards back from the player if they're signed or whatever, and then we can just deliver them when we get them back. I get it. Sure, it's a great process. But I also understand the consumer may take the brunt end of that because now they have to wait a long time to get something where which they are not actually guaranteed. They might get yeah. a replacement because, say, the company didn't get those cards back from the player or whatever else. Um, I often think about this. Now, again... The cards generally are high-end cards, which, you know, and as they should be. Every right they should be because consumers are left to wait for these procurements. Um, I, I think about this sometimes with modern, especially with high-end, when people are forking over, you know, large sums of money, and then they get a redemption card. I'm like, well, you're already paying so much. You should just have the card in hand when you buy. That's what I think about because I care about the consumer. I always care about consumers, and so especially with collectors, I care about them, and, and I... I, I I want collectors to be able to get what they receive, you know, um, with minimal wait times. 
I totally agree with you, but I, I have heard the argument a couple of times from different people that redemptions actually give you the thrill of obtaining the card twice. You get a thrill when you open a pack and you get a redemption and you know, wow, this is a great card. I'm going to have a great card. And then you send it away and then it might be, you know, who knows how long. You wait a substantial amount of time, but then one day that card actually does arrive and you get like another rush. It's like getting feeling that rush two times. Um, so, I mean, I'm not saying that I personally agree with it, but I, I've heard that argument before. And I guess it all depends, you know, assuming that you get the card that you really wanted, maybe it makes it worthwhile to, to wait, um, to have sort of that, that rush feeling twice. Um, but like I, but like you said, like if you're, if you're waiting four years, I mean, that's, that's ridiculous. Um, and I, I don't know what the, you know, the quote unquote reasonable time is. I'm, it, it, it's always, you know, going to differ. Um, but, uh, you know, it's just, it's just interesting how people, you know, have different, um, expectations and uh, reactions to redemptions. And once again, it's such, um, it's such a common part of the, of the modern hobby that, you know, if you're, if you're collecting nowadays and rip, rip, ripping open a lot of packages or, or boxes, that's, that's just part of collecting. That's just part of the process. Pulling redemptions, oh, this is redemption. I'm, I'm going to have to wait. And if, if that's, you know, what you're familiar with and that's what you know, then, um, you know, it's maybe just something that you can accept a little, a little bit easier than maybe, you know, in, in the past. Sure. Good stuff, man. Awesome, awesome stuff. So thank you for being a part of this segment of, of questions, Brian. Uh, no problem. Anytime. Thank you for watching another episode of Radicards TV on Radicards.com. And until next time, enjoy collecting. If you like this video, please subscribe. Enjoy collecting. Thank you.